I'd like to welcome you again to today's webinar entitled Strategic Risk Management in Healthcare, Taking Healthcare ERM to the Next Level. Today's session is being sponsored by the Stanford Center for Professional Development and the Strategic Decision and Risk Management Certificate Program. My name is Hannah Winter, and I'm a partner at SDG and Associate Program Director of the Stanford Strategic Decision and Risk Management Program. Today I have an esteemed group of colleagues with me. I'd like to spend a few minutes introducing the folks you'll hear from today. Two of our speakers, Jeff Driver and Ed Hall, are from Stanford Hospital and Clinics Risk Consulting. Jeff Driver currently serves as the Chief Risk Officer and Executive Vice President within the Stanford University Medical Center and directs its Risk Management Consulting Division, Stanford Hospitals and Clinics Risk Consulting. Jeff has more than 25 years of experience as a risk management professional managing enterprise risk in community, tertiary, and academic medical centers. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Good morning. Ed Hall currently serves as the Senior Director of Risk Management Loss Control and Education for Stanford University Medical Center and is the Managing Director of Stanford Hospital and Clinics Risk Consulting. Ed has more than 15 years of diverse loss control and safety management experience with a particular emphasis in managing worker safety risks in healthcare and industrial sectors. Welcome, Ed. Thanks, Anna. John Salona leads SDG's Risk Management Initiative and is an instructor in the Stanford Center for Professional Development's Enterprise Risk Management course and our new course in Strategic Decision Making to Manage Risk in Healthcare Organizations. John has a law degree and more than 25 years of experience in consulting. Welcome, John. Thank you, Hannah. Good to be here. Carissa Little is the Director for Professional Programs at the Stanford Center for Professional Development. She has been with Stanford University for almost 10 years and is responsible for collaborating with Stanford faculty, industry experts, and corporate partners to develop the professional and executive programs that extend Stanford to industry. She worked in both software and education prior to coming to Stanford. Welcome, Carissa. Thank you, Hannah. Now that you know about us, we'd like to know more about you. Which of the following describes you best? Are you a healthcare risk management pro professional? Do you manage healthcare risk but not in a traditional risk management function? Are you a risk management professional but not specific to healthcare? Are you a participant in the strategic decision and risk management program? Please pick the response that describes you the best. Okay, great. It looks like many of you are responding, so I'll close the polls and show the results. Looks like most of you are healthcare risk management professionals. Uh, we're delighted to have you here, and we hope that this program is very relevant to the issues that you deal with every day. We're going to start by talking about where healthcare ERM has been and what the challenges are. We will then address the three learning objectives for this session, why leading managers of risk are focused on risk and uncertainties, why it's possible and necessary to quantify all major sources of risk and uncertainty, why focusing on risk and uncertainty allows value protection and value creation, and then we'll then talk about where healthcare ERM is going and why. And finally, where you can learn more about this topic. Now I'd like to turn it over to Jeff, who will talk about where healthcare ERM has been and what the major challenges are. Okay, once again, good morning and good afternoon to those on the East Coast and beyond. As many of you in the audience know, the management of risk in complex healthcare organizations is usually very decentralized with often separate and distinct programs managed by various leaders across the organization. As this diagram illustrates, the management of organizational risk has historically evolved into separate silos of what I coin niche risk management areas such as starting on the left, risk and end compliance activity at the organizational governance level, business continuity activities, regulatory compliance, internal audit, and worker safety functions, insurance and an alternative risk transfer, decision support, and finally clinical risk, quality, and patient safety functions. The formal and holistic collaboration and integration between these niche risk management areas 
is not commonly found in American health care management systems, but rather, more commonly, it is dependent on informal points of integration and collaboration between the various leaders of these niche risk management areas. The other aspect of managing total risk program value, as many of you have heard, is that managing risk is not just about protecting that value, but about creating or squeezing out additional value. Creating and enhancing value is often referred to as the upside of risk, or as we indicate on this slide, upside uncertainty. This is a very powerful concept in these recent economic times and will continue to be imperative for leading risk managers to learn about and integrate into their risk management practice. At Stanford University Medical Center, as you will soon hear from my colleagues, we have been weaving upside risk analysis tools into our risk management processes, as well as strategic and business planning with great success for the medical enterprise. I'll now turn it over to John Salona, who will discuss why leading managers of risk are focusing on risk and uncertainty. Thank you, Jeff. We start with considering what is a risk and why leading managers of risk are also focusing on uncertainty. The dictionary and common understanding define risk as exposure to chance of injury or loss. It's all about the bad things that could happen to you. Thus, risk management began as trying to prevent, mitigate, or ensure against possible bad events. Trying to redefine risk to include the upside handles an important issue, but sometimes just seems to add to the confusion. Instead, we like to broaden our thinking to include uncertainty, which includes, not, which includes everything that is not definitely ascertainable or fixed as to when it will occur or in what quantity. For healthcare organizations, there are many daunting uncertainties not easily handled by loss control or loss avoidance methods aimed primarily at bad events. For example, how many patients will be coming through your door over the next decade and what kind of services will they need? What staff and equipment will you require to meet those needs? What will your patients and insurers be willing and able to pay for? And lastly, perhaps one of the biggest uncertainties of all, how will all of these be impacted by health care reform? The task gets even harder when you start considering major decisions such as acquiring a hospital. Acquiring a hospital brings a slew of known kinds of risks such as workers' compensation claims, medical malpractice claims, vehicle liability, and so on. It also brings with it a whole lot of all too real uncertainties like what competing facilities in your area will do, how much key staff you'll retain, what kind of combined cost savings you'll realize, effect on reputation, and what future revenue growth of the acquired hospital will be. All these need to be considered, but people are not good at doing all this in their head. It's just too complex. I'll ask Hannah to put up the next poll to consider whether in your organization you include risks and uncertainties in your risk management. So let's look at this next poll. Do you consider uncertainties where the outcome is not known in addition to risks like chance of loss or injury? Please select the answer that best corresponds to how you handle it in your organization. Do you systematically do that or rarely or never do it? Great. It looks like uh, many of you are responding, so I'm going to close the polls and show the results. It looks like most of you sometimes consider them, consider uncertainties, but you don't systematically elicit them in addition to risk factors. Thank you, Hannah. We all know our mission is to create the most value for all our stakeholders, patients, staff, regulators, owners, and community. But have you considered how that value is itself uncertain? It depends on all the same sorts of uncertain factors we just listed in the context of acquiring a hospital. One way to think of the overarching job of the board and the CEO is to increase this uncertain value 
which shifts the distribution over to the right for more value, and to reduce the risk, which narrows the distribution. When we think about the uncertainty this way, you see how responsibility for the total uncertainty in value splits among organizational roles, but the need for uncertainty management cuts across the entire enterprise. The downside risks are managed by the CRO, or risk managers, who are charged with avoiding, mitigating, or transferring the risk from potential bad events. In particular, the CFO is charged with staying on top of the financial safety risk so no one stays up at night worrying about insolvency. The middle part of the distribution, the day-to-day -day operations, are managed by the people who handle your clinical operations, insurance, and billing, and so forth. They manage all the normal risks and uncertainties in the enterprise. On the right side, the corporate development or strategy folks are charged with creating the future upside for the enterprise, new facilities or practices which will drive prosperity going into the future. It's very unlikely that your facility still has a polio ward, but just how much resources should go to dealing with bariatric patients versus investing more in orthopedics or oncology. Grappling with these uncertainties, though, is critical for creating value and is why managers of risk who broaden their thinking to include uncertainty become leaders who create value in addition to protecting against loss. I'll now ask Ed Hall to talk about how, by thinking along these lines, they managed to turn the Safe Patient Handling Program at Stanford into one which has garnered numerous awards and recognitions, including an award for best practices. Ed. Thanks, John. Patient handling and movement was a primary loss driver in our workers' compensation area. Moving patients that are not self-ambulatory is a high-risk activity that puts our healthcare workers and patients at risk for injury. We now had to find a solution to this costly occurrence in our healthcare organization. We illustrate on this slide the patient mobility of our population base. This illustration pictures the capital equipment that would be needed to address this challenge. Now, to justify the program, we started with data on employee injuries from, pa from handling patients. This got our arms around the risk of employee injuries we were hoping to prevent and their costs. Each category represents the transfers that happen within the organization and the costs associated with those transfers from a workers' compensation perspective. This allowed us to show, to show that you will have to address several issues and all the equipment on the previous slide would be necessary to address such a complex concern. We also had data on the lost and restricted days from patient handling injuries. The first level of looking at the data from the risk events we were trying to prevent was enough to justify a program for our existing facility. Using this data, we calculated an internal rate of return for the program of 27% with a hurdle rate of 15%. This was enough. However, we ran into problems trying to put together an overhead lift program for the new hospital Stanford Hospital and Clinics is building. There was an effort to contain costs from a pre-construction budget. Based on just the risk data we had put together, the program didn't look good enough and it was at risk to be cut. We knew there were other real tangible benefits we got from the program, but they were uncertain and we didn't have the data to quantify them things like reduction in pressure ulcers, and maybe even um, reduce employee turnover. The physical demands of the job are the single biggest reason given for leaving the nursing profession, and we knew it cost around $60,000 to recruit and train new nurses. We needed some way to quantify and show total value of the program, not just the items we had historic, historical data to support. I'll ask John now to talk about why it was possible and necessary to quantify all the major sources of uncertainty and risk. Thank you, Ed. In our data-driven world, the first question we hit regarding any proposition is, where is your data to support it? Make no mistake, collecting and understanding the data is absolutely necessary. But the problem with relying only on data is that for the questions we're most interested in, what will happen in the future, there isn't any data, nor will there be any until you've gone and done something and it's too late. 
That doesn't mean you should ignore things just because there's no data. Not quantifying a risk or uncertainty can be even worse. Words such as likely or unlikely hide considerable ambiguity, and people usually disagree on what likely means when you ask them to put a number to it. What's more, without quantification, there's no way to measure the effectiveness of risk mitigation. Even risk rankings become a matter of personality and politics. There is a proven, theoretically sound way of filling this gap with subjective probability estimates. It involves careful use of assess assessment methods to get the best opinions from experts and expressing those opinions as a number. You're already quite familiar with these, only you probably don't realize it. Last week when I checked the forecast of rain today for the San Francisco Bay Area, there was a 10% chance of rain. That doesn't mean that the forecaster looked at all the historical weather data for November 16th and it rained 10% of those days. Nor does it mean that 10% of today it will be raining. The 10% chance is the forecaster's subjective estimate for the chance of some rain today given everything he or she knows about the weather patterns and how they're moving around. That's what we mean by a subjective estimate. It is your expert's best guess as to the chance something will happen. It's just expressed as a number to remove the ambiguity around descriptions like unlikely versus very unlikely. I'll repeat, we always can and need to look at the data. But in addition to not quantifying uncertainty, where people repeatedly go wrong is relying only on historical data. Relying on historical data analysis is only appropriate when you have a stable system and significant, statistically significant data set. It works great for life insurance mortality tables. Try relying on it to determine where the stock market is going, and you might as well throw your money down the hole. I'll discuss two examples to show how possible and necessary it is to quantify major uncertainties and risks using the right methods. In the first example of AIG, key risks they knew about were not quantified and were ignored. In the second example of the space shuttle, key risks were quantified but not acted on because there was no supporting data. Let's start with AIG. You'll all recall the great subprime mortgage boom in which people got loans on little or no documentation. The lenders didn't care because they prepackaged the loans together and sold them to people who could carve them up into, into securities and sell them on to other people. Part of the reason this great shell game worked was that people could buy what was called a credit default swap, or CDS, which paid them if they didn't get paid on the security. AIG sold tens of billions of dollars worth of these. When AIG looked at the risks of selling these, they knew they faced three risks. First, they'd have to pay if there was a default or non-payment on a security. Second, their credit rating would be downgraded, which could cost them in a variety of ways. Lastly, they could be asked to put up more collateral to support their ability to pay off a CDS. The first of these risks they analyzed using historical data, which was not representative. The tiny chances of default they calculated were just junk. The other two risks they simply ignored because there was no data to analyze. In the end, it was the rating downgrades and collateral calls which pushed AIG to the brink of bankruptcy before the government stepped in with a $100 billion bailout. In the second example of the space shuttle, Professor Elizabeth Pate Cornell of Stanford, who teaches in our program, was asked in 1990 to analyze risks for the space shuttle. She focused in on the insulating heat tiles on the bottom of the shuttle. The diagram shows how she put all the pieces together to use what data there was and to elicit expert judgments. Tiles could be lost because they could be hit with debris or glue failed. Additional adjacent tiles could then be lost with the intense heating on reentry. If there was burn through in those areas, the key subsystems underneath were lost, the shuttle could be lost. She used a combination of looking at all the data and supplemented with expert opinions expressed as the kind of probability numbers we've been talking about. Professor Pate Cornell concluded that lost tiles added up to the risk of a total loss of the shuttle in one out of every 100 flights. 
Here's the diagram showing how critical the risk was on every area underneath the shuttle depending on what was underneath. She also concluded that 15% of the tiles contributed 85% of the total risk and that the risk of total failure could be reduced by 70% at a very small cost. In contrast, an analysis looking only at the historical data concluded that the risk of shuttle loss was only 1 in 3,000 flights, but the problem was the sample was too small after only 67 flights and the result was unstable. Professor Pate Cornell was asked where was the data supporting her figure for a total loss of 1 out of 100 flights, and then NASA buried her study. The missing data occurred on February 1, 2003, when the Space Shuttle Columbia burned up on reentry after tiles were damaged by debris on takeoff. For that tragic flight, NASA actually knew the damage on takeoff had occurred, but didn't spend much time inspecting an orbit because there was nothing they could do about it at that point anyway. I'll ask Hannah now to conduct our next poll on whether your organization quantifies uncertainties or relies solely on historical data analysis. Okay, so in your organization, how do you quantify risks and uncertainties? Do you use only historical data? Do you use both historical data and subjective estimates? Do you use only subjective estimates? But you, or you evaluate everything qualitatively, but you don't quantify them. So go ahead and click next to the box that uh, best describes your answer. Great. It looks like many of you are responding, so I'll go ahead and close the polls and show the results. It looks like a vast majority of you use both historical data and subjective estimates, and that's fantastic. Thank you, Hannah. I'll recap briefly on why it is so important to quantify all major risks and uncertainties. First, you don't omit critical risks or uncertainties for lack of data. Second, you can make better decisions explicitly considering these uncertainties. Lastly, identifying which risks and uncertainties have the greatest impact on value creates new options for better managing risk and increasing value. Let's now delve a little deeper into why focusing on risk and uncertainty allows value protection and value creation. We'll pick up with the issues Ed had for the Safe Patient Handling Program at Stanford. For the Safe Patient Handling Program at Stanford, we put together a comprehensive picture of all the sources of value and risk using a combination of the data Ed already showed you and subjective estimates. This is a picture of all the risk and uncertainty factors related together, exactly the same kind of diagram that Professor Pate Cornell put together for the space shuttle, but just done for safe patient handling. Here it is a little bit bigger so you can read it. For example, we mentioned that we know that the single biggest demands of, of uh, the single biggest reason that people leave nursing is because of the physical demands of the job. If we can get one nurse to stay because she no longer has to physically handle patients, we save the $60,000 cost to recruit and train a new nurse. So for that issue, we gathered all the staff in a room and asked the questions. What is the smallest possible impact we could have on turnover? Give us a number. And given how low the turnover is at Stanford, that answer was maybe zero, no impact at all. And what is the largest possible impact? It was that simple. We just needed to quantify the uncertainty. We can then figure out which uncertainties have the greatest impact on total program value and have a hard look at whether we believe the estimates or could come up with some better ones. While we were at it, we looked at all the other things we could get out of safe patient handling, which are all shown here on this diagram. Could we reduce the incidence of pressure ulcers? Could we get more patient referrals because patients feel greater dignity and independence with being able to toilet themselves and with not being heaved into the MRI machine like a sack of potatoes? This next chart shows the results of taking all the quantified uncertainties, 
calculating the potential impact on program value and arranging them from biggest impact to smallest. This sorting gives the graph the shape of a tornado, which is why we call it that. I also like to call it a tornado because it shows what could blow you away. What it showed was that the way to get the most additional value out of safe patient handling program was to work on the turnover reduction. If you could go from the low estimate of no impact at all to the high estimate of a 20% reduction in the turnover at Stanford, that would add $3.5 million in program value. In contrast, the, re the reduction in lost and restricted days and workers' comp were number six and seven on the ranking of value drivers, even though these were all the program was initially justified on. Then we went the next step and looked at what happens when you vary everything all at the same time, because that's reality. All these uncertainties will be varying all at the same time. This gives us a probability distribution on total program value, which is what we're really after. Here's what the probability distribution looked like in terms of internal rate of return. If you look at the lower left part of it, you see that in the worst case scenario, where the costs are the greatest and the benefits are the least, the program still has an internal rate of return of 50%. That's versus the 27% internal rate of return that was initially calculated. And the mean value of all this uncertainty, which is what we bet on for decision-making purposes, is 111%. We can also take that mean program value and break it down into components of value, which is what this chart shows. It's another way to look at it and it's often easier than reading a probability distribution. People love seeing the program laid out in a chart like this, but their, qu but their question always is, is it real? That's what quantifying the uncertainty does for us. We know the best case and the worst case scenarios, and we know we can bet on a mean of that for decision-making purposes. And now, Let's have Ed tell us exactly how Stanford used the ident this identification of key value drivers to get more value out of their safe patient handling program. Thanks, John. We are ending year one and seeing the fruits of our labor. We have set up dashboards to track progress on certain indicators and put in new awareness measures that highlight the safe patient handling benefits to staff and patients. But first, let's take a quick survey before we go into the results. Hannah? So we'd like to hear from you again. Do your risk management programs reveal how to create value? Yes, by design. They uh, focus only on loss avoidance. Or we count less expensive loss avoidance as value creation. Or they occasionally reveal ways to create new value. Or systematically, you're looking for ways to create new value. Or maybe you've thought about it, but you still don't know how to do it. Please go ahead and choose the answer that best describes how your organization uh, handles the risk management programs. Great. Looks like many of you are responding, so I'm going to go ahead and close the polls and show the results. So it looks like most of you have thought about it but don't know how to do it. And then some of you also, another high response was that your programs occasionally reveal ways to create new value. But there definitely seems like there's room for improvement here. Thanks, Anna. Here you'll see the results have been measured thus far and are plotted on our tornado grid diagram with the red arrow. Our overall cost of workers' compensation should have increased due to several factors, erosion of current law, increase in the cost for medical and indemnity payments for injured workers, to name just a few. But instead of an increase, we have had a 40% reduction in our workers' compensation costs in the area of safe patient handling, which in turn had a reduction in our lost day cost. We have also had the employee satisfaction scores done by Gallup increased in departments where the equipment was implemented. On the question, I have the tools and equipment necessary to do my job, we actually experienced a 7% improvement. We also have comments from our patients who told our staff they would come back for necessary diagnostic tests 
because we have the patient handling equipment that moves them in a secure and respectful manner. We have now been identified and recognized for this work as a national best practice on how to develop a business case for safe patient handling. This process has been published in the new design and construction guidelines for healthcare facilities on overhead system installation justification. We were published in, ASHRAM, in the ASHRAM monograph on value-driven ERM, and finally, just last week, we won the Stanford Melinda S. Mitchell Service and Quality Award. And now I'll turn it over to Jeff to tell us what all this means for where healthcare ERM is going and why. Jeff? Okay, thank you, Ed, and uh, thank you for all you've done for Stanford, and congratulations on your award. Um, in terms of where healthcare ERM is going, typical ERM roadmaps, like the one shown here, do recognize the need to move from a downside risk mitigation or value protection focus to one that at least equally focuses on value creation. The question is how one actually does that. Board-level involvement and sponsorship Plus, integration with business planning uh, processes are certainly important, but suppose your organ organization actually has these. The question is, what would the ERM staff actually be doing to create value? This chart illustrates the journey of enterprise risk management from purely transactional defensive risk management to the more common advanced management of risk deployed in modern risk management programs today. The holy grail in enterprise risk management is to, is to move towards strategic risk management that holistically deals with not only the downside of risk, but of at least equal importance, the upside of risk. You can see that in this cutting edge model for enterprise risk management, it is filled with good phrases like support objectives and capture opportunities. But how exactly would you do that? As we discussed with the last poll, it's very hard to make the connection from a traditional downside loss avoidance focus to one that includes the upside and value creation. What we actually see in most organizations which have ERM is that they combine loss avoidance with some sort of process for eliciting and ranking risks, usually in a risk register or a heat map, and then they plan mitigation for what people agree are the biggest risks. Two years ago, the top of everybody's risk register was avian flu pandemic, which never really happened. Now at the top of everyone's risk register is economic meltdown, which has already happened. Suppose you have economic meltdown on your risk register. What do you actually do about it, and how do you know what you get out of those efforts? To achieve the full potential of enterprise risk management, including value creation, ERM needs a frame shift to understanding the uncertainty in value. To do this at Stanford, we take a very concrete approach. We quantify the major risks and uncertainties. We develop comprehensive alternatives for both mitigating risk and creating value. We quantify the range of uncertainty from what we could get out of different alternatives and use that to guide this, the decision. Then we monitor to make sure we are getting the value anticipated and we watch for any surprises. With this approach, there is no difference in how one goes about protecting value versus creating value. It's really all part of the same picture. It brings ERM into the mainstream of how we think about and run the organization. This is the direction that healthcare ERM needs to move to, including value creation, and we're delighted to be part of figuring out how to make that happen. With that, I'll turn it over to Carissa Little to talk a little more about uh, what you might learn. Thank you, Jeff. Um, at the Stanford Center for Professional Development, we've been delivering education to industry for over 40 years. So we have reasonable experience in creating educational programs to meet the career-long learning needs of professionals, managers, and executives in industry. Here you can see the areas where we offer part-time master's degrees and certificates for graduate credit. You know, many of these are um, available entirely online, um, and so that's a great benefit to working professionals. And here are professional certificates. These are created to be very intensive programs that are specifically geared towards working professionals. We at the Stanford 
Center for Professional Development are pleased to be working um, with the Strategic Decisions Group and in partnership with Professor Ron Howard, who is the founder of the Decision Analysis Field, and he's a faculty member in the Management Science and Engineering Department at Stanford. We believe that the Strategic Decision and Risk Management Program is a unique offering because it blends the industry practical experience from experts like Jeff, Ed, and John with the Stanford theory and research, resulting in a rigorous program. What we tried to do in creating this program was offer courses via flexible delivery options so participants can either come to Stanford's campus in March or September, online via streaming video at any time, or through the SDG program um, where they come to your company site to deliver courses for cohorts of about 20 or more. We've been hearing about the challenges in this space from the medical administration community for quite some time. And by collaborating with the Stanford Hospital Risk Consulting Group and the American Society of Healthcare Risk Management, we've been able to introduce a new course, Strategic Decision Making to Manage Risk in Healthcare Organizations. This led to our creating a new emphasis in healthcare as an option for the Strategic Decision and Risk Management Certificate Program. You'll see the new emphasis requires four courses, including decision analysis, decision quality, collaborative decision making and negotiation, as well as the new course. We believe that the program um, here allows leaders to make uh, significant changes in enterprise risk management within the healthcare industry. Here you can see um, the calendar, um, which has the dates for the March on campus events and when the core and elective courses are offered, as well as some pricing details. We also have an early registration discount if you sign up by February 1st for the March courses, where you'll save approximately $200 per course. We would also like to point out that Ashram is making available a number of educational grants to their members um, for the new course, Strategic Decision Making to Manage Risk in Healthcare Organizations. Please visit their website to apply. Um, there are both full and partial grants available, and they'll be awarded on a first-come, first-served basis. So if you're interested in that, you may want to act quickly. Um, and with that, we'd like to ask for your feedback on one final poll. Um, if you could please indicate your level of interest in the new uh, emphasis in healthcare for the Strategic Decision and Risk Management um, Certificate Program. And we'll just wait a few minutes. Um, for the results to come in. We really appreciate your feedback on this question. It helps us determine how frequently we'll offer these new, um, these new courses. Okay, thank you so much. And with that, I will turn it over to Hannah, who will help facilitate our Q&A period. Thank you, Carissa. We've answered some of the questions that you've sent in by text as they've come in, and you've seen them show up in the queue, but a few came up that we thought we would uh, ask the presenters to discuss. So the first question that we had was, how does your system relate to ISO 31000, Principles of Risk Management? So uh, the ISO 31000 standards lays out um, a lot of definitions and taxonomy for risk management, and it also lays out a risk management process. That risk management process is fairly generic in which you, you have a risk assessment um, where you need to identify risks, you need to analyze risks, you need to evaluate them, and then you need to treat them, and then monitoring and review goes along with that. The, the risk management that we're talking about here is, is identical at a process level. The question is, how do you go about analyzing and evaluating your risks? And what we've given you today is a, a taste of some of what we feel is a better methodology, both for analyzing and evaluating risks and for broadening your focus to including uncertainties in addition to what people traditionally think of as risks. Great, thank you. Now, we had a couple questions on the tornado. The first question on the tornado chart was, what program did you use to create that chart? Uh, so that program was actually um, created in an application called Supertree, 
which will um, produce probability distributions and the uh, tornado chart. And there is a student version of that that uh, you can download for free to try out. Uh, there's a number of other applications that do it. And some people even just do it in Excel. The, the process is fairly simple in that you need to define an input with this range of numbers that we're talking about. And then you just change which one of those numbers you do and keep, you're using in the calculation. And you keep track of the result and plot it. So there, there are a number of software choices to do it. Uh, but you could actually do it yourself in Excel. And some people, um, some people do that. So I would also mention that at Stanford, uh, within the risk management department, we have about 20 people. We've loaded uh, SuperTree up onto the desktops of our key employees so they can actually go in and do this kind of analysis and become quite familiar and weave it into our practices. And it's, it's received uh, wide acceptance in the risk management department, and folks really love to use it. Great. Thank you. And one more question we had about the tornado. What is the scale of the impact asked from experts? Uh, let me let me see if I understand the question. There's a, there's two parts to that question. So first is, what do we ask the experts when we're asking the questions? And we, and we ask them a series of three questions. Uh, what's a number that is low enough that you think it's extremely unlikely reality would be lower than this? And we'll say uh, there's a 10% chance that it could be lower. So not a crazy low number, but a number low enough you'd be surprised if it was less than this. Then likewise, on the high side, we ask, well, what's a number high enough that you think there's only a 10% chance the actual would be higher? And we ask to lay out a number for that. And then lastly, we say, give me your 50-50. So what's a number where you think it's, uh, it's equally likely reality would be above or below this? So what this does is it lets us ask the expert for a range on the uncertainty. And then the impact is a calculated number. So we have to build a little model of how each of the inputs translates through to a value measure, like we did for change in turnover. For every person you don't turn over, you save $60,000. And then the result of taking that expert's guess and then tracking it through to the, the calculated impact on value is what we show on the tornado diagram. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, another question. How do we, as risk managers, convince senior leadership how important ERM is? There's a struggle to sell the strategic ERM program as paramount to the organization, but it's really as important as corporate compliance. So how do we convince senior leadership about this? So I think that's a, a very good point and an a important question because, um, you know, we are all uh, competing for sort of tough resources. And the way we've done it at Stanford is we sort of started small with a, a demonstration project, if you will. And then once you can show success using these methods, um, you can build from there and then start weaving it into other projects. And then really on that continuum, beginning to move it forward into the organization, success breeds success. So uh, we think there is a great return on uh, weaving these methodologies into your program. Really need to be reasonable, start small, build, and, and move on from there. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so this is a little bit of the opposite of starting small. We had a question from someone who says, I work in a facility with 515 licensed beds, and I'm the only risk manager or patient safety officer. How can I be effective in an institution of this size? Well, I think when, you're, when you wear a lot of hats and you're very busy, it's sort of like command and control. And one of the things you have to do is look at who can help you uh, and infuse these processes into your organization. One person certainly can't do it all, but I think if, with the, the right use of, of people that can help you, you can get it done and you, you can make it happen. So you just have to really think about who you bring in uh, to help in that situation because certainly uh, there's a lot on the risk manager's plate. And I like to sort of envision a plate. You have to think about taking some some things off the plate, 
so you can make room for other important strategic work. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, now, another uh, question on the analysis. Why did you use IRR, or internal rate of return, instead of NPV, or net present value? We used internal rate of return um, mainly because the, the finance group that, does, that works um, with the capital committee um, has set up a process internally, and um, their, their tool that they use specifically calls for an internal rate of return to do cost justification for any capital projects. So your organization may look at internal rate of return. It may look at net present value. Um, it, just learn to work within your um, current structure and processes to get the program sold so that you can uh, make the best business case depending on how they're set up. So that could change and vary from organization to organization. Okay, great. Another question, how can a prejudice toward utilizing forensic data be bridged for those who have trouble digesting projective or uncertain uncertainty-related data? Uh, well, for that, I think uh, you have to make the case that we were making in the uh, the webinar today, which is that the answer to everything can't be found in historical data. And people definitely have a very strong bias towards relying on historical data. And it's absolutely necessary to use forensic data uh, wherever it's possible. You just have to be aware of the limitations of that data and to realize that there's this other perspective for capturing a lot of what people, what I call people's common sense about what's going on and the impacts of things that you can't represent by doing an analysis on a particular data set. So uh, the examples, the kind of examples that I give to people to explain this include things like uh, the weather forecast example that uh, we talked about today. Another example I'll often use is the choice between picking a fixed rate mortgage versus a variable rate mortgage. And guess what? A variable rate mortgage depends on a future uncertainty called interest rates in the future. And there isn't any historical data which will tell you for sure what interest rates in the future are going to be. So people need to realize that as, as necessary as it is to look at all the data that you have, the answers to the questions you really want to know is not in historical data, and relying only on historical data is like driving your car by looking only in the rearview mirror. If the road is straight, it's okay, but it's pretty easy to end up in the ditch. Great. Thanks, John. We're going to take one more question. The rest will answer by text at the uh, after the session is over. So uh, one of the questions that we were um, asked is, uh, what other statistical techniques, like Monte Carlo simulation, can be used to quantify risk, and how do these results uh, combine with the subjective estimates? Well, a, uh, a Monte Carlo simulation is uh, really just another way of calculating the numbers. And if you, if you know um, what you're doing, you can use these subjective estimates as an input to a Monte Carlo simulation because it does the same thing. It just puts in different sets of data inputs and it calculates a number. The problem that most people have using Monte Carlo simulations is it, it's very easy to do garbage in, garbage out. In, in this approach where we are looking at a tornado diagram first to figure out what the key uncertainties are. It really focuses attention on the uncertainties that make the most difference and whether those are the best estimates that we can get or we can get a better expert or get a better estimate. The biggest problem with Monte Carlo is that it's very easy just to do plus or minus 5%, plus or minus 10% on all the inputs to the Monte Carlo. It produces a beautiful S-curve no matter what you put in, so it makes it very easy for people to not think about those uncertainty ranges and to just turn the crank, and out of that you get uh, no insight at all. Thanks, John. We're going to answer the remaining questions uh, at the end of the session by text. And so now I'd like to uh, finish up here by thanking you, ladies and gentlemen, for participating in today's webinar. This concludes today's session.
As a reminder, you may download a PDF of the slides by clicking on the handouts icon in the menu bar, selecting the file, and clicking download. As Carissa mentioned, our next set of on-campus courses will be from March 14th through 25th. We hope you can join us then. Our new course in strategic decision making to manage risk in healthcare organizations will be held from March 21st to the 23rd. That's one of the four required courses for this new certificate emphasis in healthcare. The other three are decision analysis, decision quality in organizations, and enterprise risk management. So all four of those required courses will be offered in March, and most of them are available online as well. And with, as with any of our uh, other online courses, if the online option works better for you, you can access most of our courses anytime, anywhere. We thank you for joining us.